I'm delighted to welcome uh, everybody today uh, to this evening's webinar, uh, which is all about the Panorama uh, Doctoral Training Program. Uh, my name is Rob Durrell. Uh, I'm the whole lead for the NERC DTP uh, based here from uh, the University of Hull, uh, which hosts uh, the, uh, the, the DTP in the Energy Environment Institute. Uh, the Energy Environment Institute itself is a, a, a cross-faculty organisation um, designed to enable transdisciplinary research, uh, such as that conducted um, through the Panorama DTP uh, across a, a, a wide range of, of different disciplines and, and, and subjects uh, here at the university, and the different partners uh, that make up uh, the Panorama programme, including uh, the universities of Leeds um, and Hull. Um, now, uh, we've got a really exciting range of uh, projects, uh, which we're going to hear a little bit uh, more about um, from uh, the various supervisors uh, later on tonight. Uh, but first, I wanted to give you uh, a real uh, view um, of, um, of what the um, Panorama project is about uh, uh, from our students. So if I hand over to Lydia and we move on to the next slide, please. Hi everyone, I'm a first year PhD student on the Panorama DTP and I'm looking at the threat of invasive species to Antarctica. And I'm just going to cover a bit of what the application process actually looks like. Um, so one of the first things I really wanted to cover was the fact that it's really important to speak to your supervisors prior to your application. So for me, I involved sending them a CV and then we actually ended up having a two hour chat. And in this, it's an opportunity for you to get to know whether you'd work together. It's not just whether the supervisors think you're a good fit, it's whether you feel like you'd be a good fit for them. And it's a good time to ask questions such as what kind of training opportunities there are and whether you're working in a team or on your own. Um, and for me, the DTP was a win, mostly because of the training. Like for example, I'm going to Leeds tomorrow for the second time to work over some training on personal effectiveness. Last week, it, last month it was on goal setting and it, they're little things that really make a massive difference um, to how you approach your PhD journey and how you feel and like prevent you getting overwhelmed, which I think is one of the nicest things about the EI and the DTP. It's very much a community and you're not in it alone. With individual PhD projects, I've spoken to people, they can end up feeling like they're very isolated, um, which isn't where you want to be. I'm going to hand you over to Rick now. Thanks, Lydia. Hi, everybody. Um, so unlike Lydia, who's just joined um, the DTP, I am now a fourth year in my write-up period of um, my PhD. And I've actually been at the University of Hull now for 10 years. I did my undergraduate here, I did a master's here, and now I'm doing, well, just about finishing off the PhD here in the DTP. Um, as Rob alluded to, um, at the start, the DTP offers such a wide um, range and scope of topics. And hopefully as we go through the webinar today, you'll be able to see some of that breadth um, covered by the, the, uh, the supervisors of each of the individual um, topics. But the DTP for me was fantastic and it gave me um, the opportunity to study something that not many other universities were doing because the DTP offered me that, that opportunity. So I look at um, how plastics uh, weather in the marine environment and it's not something I can find anywhere else. And the DTP gave me that um, uh, ability to, to study what I wanted to study. What I would really want to talk to you today is about Hull and kind of coming to a new place. A lot of you will be traveling quite far to come to the University of Hull and I just want to let you know it's a really really nice place to be. Um, for those that aren't familiar with uh, the UK at all, those that are coming from abroad, um, there's a north split divide, Hull is in the north, the north is very friendly and Hull is probably one of the friendliest places um, in, in the north, well I think so anyway. Um, and I like it that much. I've stayed here for 10 years. I've settled and I've bought a house with my, fam uh, my family. So we absolutely love it here. So rest assured, you're coming to a really nice part of the UK. Um, and also the university itself, really, really great um, community, great support. And because you'll be falling under the, the Energy and Environment Institute, you have a home within the university. So although it's cross-disciplinary, 
is always our central hub that you can come back to. So I can talk forever, um, but I won't. And I shall now hand over to um, the, the main bulk of the um, webinar today. I'm going to hand over to Rob Thomas to start us off. Thanks, Rick. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about our project, which is called Seeing in the Dark the Sediment, uh, the Fluid Dynamics of Sediment Rich Flows. So until now, we've been really unable to simultaneously measure the flow velocities, sediment concentrations and particle sizes in many geophysical and industrial flows because they're so heavily laden with sediment. This has prevented us from using established optical or acoustic techniques to measure them. The quantification of the process controlling the movement of particles in these opaque flows therefore remains the holy grail of process sedimentology. This project aims for the first time to develop algorithms for a new three-dimensional ultrasound system, which will enable us to take volumetric measurements of flow velocities, particle sizes, and concentrations in sediment-rich turbulent flows. The instrument and algorithms will then be validated using well-studied test cases, such as flows in a pipe flow loop or particles settling in a column, before we then aim to quantify the velocities, concentrations, and bed form development within cohesive sediment-laden open channel flows or within a turbidity current, such as you can see here. The resulting data will help us to unpick those intricate relationships between fluid flows and sediment movement, driving the major improvements we expect to, un to understand sediment transport processes and in monitoring environmental and industrial flows. So these have wide ranging implications for understanding those flows, but also for paleo environmental interpretation. Next slide, please. The supervisory team consists of me, uh, and I've got 15 years of monitoring environmental flows, together with three other environmental scientists. So we have Steve Simmons, who you might meet later, who's got 20 years experience of applying multi-frequency acoustics to sedimentary flows. We have Gareth Keevil, who's got 20 years experience of measuring and visualizing turbulent flows using acoustics and optics in a range of natural and industrial settings. And then we have Professor Jeff Peekle, who's got 30 years experience of studying the processes and geological products of sedimentary flows in natural environments such as rivers and submarine channels and industrial settings such as slurry transfer pipes and nuclear waste ponds. So that's my project. Thank you for listening and over to the next person. Hello. So um, I'm here today to uh, present um, our project. Um, so um, our project is um, about um, capturing um, carbon capturing using uh, non renewable uh, waste. So um, due to the significant um, uh, um, consumption of, um, of uh, fossil fuels, um, uh, that leads to uh, exponential um, increase in uh, CO2 uh, concentration in the atmosphere, which leads to, which is the driving for, uh, uh, the main driver to um, um, climate change and uh, ocean acidification. So um, instead of uh, landfilling the non-recyclable uh, waste like uh, non-recyclable paper and plastic, the, uh, some uh, commercial partners try to convert these um, uh, waste into fuel. Um, one of uh, these commercial um, uh, biomass uh, derived from non-recyclable uh, waste uh, is known as um, uh, subcoal. Uh, produced by N plus P group, and this is used uh, as a fuel for uh, in cement industry and uh, steel industry. So um, the, um, we um, aim in this project to utilize the biochar, the salt waste from the paralysis of uh, and thermal conversion of uh, this um, subcoal biomass or this bi uh, biomass to um, to um, uh, develop. Um, cost-effective and efficient um, um, adsorbent, salt adsorbent, to capture um, uh, CO2 and then also try to enhance the efficiency, the adsorption efficiency of this um, uh, adsorbent uh, using uh, um, some um, chemical and physical modifications. Um, and this will, um, uh, will be um, one of the uh, steps in the journey to Reduce the um, uh, carbon capture, uh, reduce the uh, sorry the CO2 uh, concentration and improve the efforts in uh, carbon capture um, 
um, um, uh, journey. And uh, yeah, so this is my project. Um, next slide, please. So um, the supervisors here, uh, sorry. the supervisors here is me. Um, I have uh, uh, four years in um, uh, fluid um, uh, dynamics and uh, uh, surface um, uh, engineering, um, uh, starting from uh, University of Leeds and now for two years in Hull. Um, and um, we have also uh, Dr. Mark Taylor um, um, with uh, more than 10 years um, um, uh, experience in carbon capture um, uh, and fuel utilization. Um, and uh, Dr. Ben Koch uh, in um, um, uh, life cycle assessments and um, 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 modeling of um, processes, um, uh, carbon capture processes, um, also in uh, engineering and environmental institute in health. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for watching and greetings from Cranley Hall. I'm Petra, I'm a senior lecturer at the Hall York Mental School. And the project that we would like to pitch is called Happy Wound Healing, investigating those effects of Prozac and fish skin wound healing. You'll have the potential to work very closely with aquaculture industry and we have excellent connections in that space. And you know that science uh, today the most exciting science is happening at the interface of disciplines. This project sits at that interface between biology, toxicology, pollution, wound healing, pharmacy, environmental and biomedical sciences. So really, really exciting stuff. And you have the potential to work with both fish and human skin models. Next slide please, Amy. The project itself. So about one in five of us are taking antidepressants, for example, for depression. A few hours later, we are going to excrete those antidepressants in our urine. And that ends in wastewater treatment plants, which are not designed to remove those antidepressants. The result being that Prozac antidepressants end up in freshwater systems, where we know it's been known for many years, and there, Prozac can affect fish behavior. Next slide, please, Amy. So over the past four years or so, we have investigated the effect of Prozac on human wound healing. So on the top left, you can see some human cells, and this is what we call a scratch assay. What you can see is that in the presence of Prozac, that scratch, that wound, heals faster. On the top, uh, sorry, in the bottom left, that's human skin biopsies. And again, you can see that on, in the presence of Prozac, that hole in the middle, that wound, is, is closer. Uh, the, the wound healing is faster. So the hypothesis is that Prozac will accelerate wound healing also in fish, and you will be using fish cell lines and also whole fish, and say, say, potentially access to clinical samples. Next slide, the same. So this is our team. As I say, I'm a, I'm a senior lecturer in the whole York Medical School. I'm also director of the MSc in Health and Climate Change. Domino is amazing, and you'll hear from her later on. She's a senior lecturer in marine biology, and Catherine will be the joint second supervisor, and she's, uh, she's got a, a pharmacy background and based in York. So please come and join the team. We can't wait to welcome you. Thank you. And next speaker, please. Thanks very much. So my name is Darren Cullen. I'm a lecturer here at the School of Natural Sciences at the University of Hull. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Amy. So I'm interested in behavioural physiology of insects, particularly locusts, and their phenotypic plasticity related to swarming behaviour. So locusts are a notorious pest around the world. They affect maybe up to 10% of the world's human population in years of peak swarming. And the key thing that underlines their pest status is that they have a phenotypic plasticity where their local population density drives various aspects of their biology. So if you look at the image there on the bottom of the screen, you've got solitarious locusts on the left. So this is the way that they exist at low population densities. They tend to avoid each other. They often have camouflage coloration and they're not normally a danger to crops. 
Whereas when they come together in high numbers, often because there's local rainfall in one area and they all converge on the same space, they then change tactics towards a gregarious lifestyle. So the gregarious ones on the right hand side of the screen are attracted to each other, they have high levels of activity, and crucially, they often migrate en masse, which can lead to swarming and devastating plagues, like you see in that picture on the right. That's a picture taken during a swarm in 2020 in Kenya. So locusts are a model organism in the lab for trying to understand phenotypic plasticity because we understand quite a lot already about the central nervous system and what leads from one phase to the other. But there's still lots to be known about the genes that drive these changes, the pheromones that play a role in their social interactions, and the stimuli by which they detect each other at high densities. Um, so the question is, can we find more of these stimuli and can we even try to prevent or reverse these changes um, as, they, as and when they occur? So this is a lab-based project that might have some potential for going and doing some field work, but in general this is going to be a lab-based project where we will use behavioural assays and state-of-the-art molecular and physiological techniques to try to understand behaviour. Uh, next slide please, Amy. Thank you. So as I say, I'm Darren Cullen, I'm a lecturer here in Biological Sciences with expertise in insect behaviour and molecular physiology. Uh, the other supervisors will be Domino Joyce, the senior lecturer here, who you just heard a bit about as well. She works on a range of animals, including fish and, um, and insects, and is interested also in genomic adaptation. And Professor Rob Nell is a professor of zoology with expertise in evolutionary ecology, animal behaviour and sexual selection. So yeah, please do come join the team. I'll be happy to take questions later if you have any. Thank you. Hello, um, so I'm Domino Joyce and uh, the project that I'm presenting is about salmon. Um, salmon are really important commercially, um, but also because they're declining throughout Europe and the UK. Um, and we know that some of these losses happen when the fish um, leave their spawning ground at the top of the river, migrate out to sea, um, and that tricky journey usually comes with quite a lot of population losses. So trying to understand what drives those losses is really key to trying, trying to understand um, what's causing the decline of salmon all over the, the um, all over Europe and the UK. Um, salmon are really great to study uh, because you can actually put a little microchip in them in the same way that you microchip a pet. Um, so you can um, Put the little microchip in and that means that you can track the salmon as it each individual salmon as it leaves the river and, and goes out to sea by putting receivers all the way down the river um, it's really really useful because you can tell exactly when they've disappeared on their journey out to sea and you can even put receivers uh, in the sea to figure out where they're going so they're really really great for that At the same time as you've caught them for that you can cut a little bit of fin off or a little bit of scale and get a dna sample and there's loads and loads of really good genetic resources and genomic resources for salmon so for example there's a 220,000 um uh, SNP chip, which means that we can relatively easily and cheaply do whole genome scans of quite a lot of individuals. So this project basically puts those two things together to try and use telemetry, genomics, possibly a bit of morphometrics as well, to try and understand what's happening with the seaward migration success and when it's uh, when it works and when it doesn't for Atlantic salmon. Um, we've got a pilot data set which seems to imply that particular genotypes are successful in particular years in particular rivers. So we're really interested in building on that and, and trying to um, find out more about that. Um, please may I have the next slide. Uh, so the supervisors on this project are, uh, it's completely compulsory to have your photo taken with a fish, by the way, when you work on fish. Um, so the supervisors are John Bolland, um, who works on freshwater fish migration, uh, does a lot of, lot of um, freshwater fish, has a lot of freshwater fish expertise um, all over the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and I work on the behavioural genetics of freshwater fish, a uh, bit of speciation, a bit of population genetics, all sorts of things. Um, we've supervised a DTP student together who's just about to submit. Um, he's 
got one paper published, two in review, and one almost submitted. So uh, we think we're a good uh, salmon super supervisory team. Thank you. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry about the strange blue lighting effect I've got in here. Um, hopefully, I don't look too hideous to all of you. Um, so my name is Rob Nell. Uh, you've seen me already on Darren's slide. Um, I'm a zoologist in the School of Natural Sciences. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so for any biochemists here, that animal is a frog. That's a uh, that's the common frog, Rana temporaria. And since the late 80s, frogs in the UK have been under threat from a virus called FV3 Rana virus, which has been introduced uh, several times um, and has caused quite a lot of mass die-offs in frogs um, and has generally depressed the UK frog population. Um, most of what we know about the epidemiology of Rana virus comes from people reporting mass die-offs in their ponds. Um, so they'll have a pond in their garden and they'll, one day they'll find a whole bunch of dead frogs and they'll then report that. Um, but we don't know much about its epidemiology beyond that. Uh, we do know that it infects frogs and doesn't kill them. And we know that it infects other amphibians and doesn't kill them. But beyond that, we don't know very much. Um, if we want to understand how the epidemic is happening within the UK frog population, um, and if we want to predict it in the future, and if we want to think about possible management interventions that might help preserve the UK frog population, then we're going to need to have a better understanding of how the virus spreads through the UK amphibian community in space and time. Um, so this project is to do that. Um, you may have heard of eDNA. eDNA is environmental DNA. So we're going to be pulling water out of water bodies and then sequencing the DNA in there and looking for amphibian DNA and looking for virus DNA to give us an idea about where the amphibians are and where the virus is. Um, we're going to use citizen science approaches for this as well. Um, so we're going to get people to send in water samples from their garden ponds or from the river at the bottom of their garden. And we can then sequence those as well and increase our data set. And hopefully this will give us um, an understanding of the patterns of coronavirus infection in the UK amphibian communities in space and time. Um, and then we're going to model it. So I don't need to explain about mathematical modelling of epidemics anymore because everyone's familiar with it from the COVID outbreak. You'll all have seen reports of mathematical models being used in the news. Um, we're going to be, or the student is going to be developing a simulation model of the coronavirus epidemic in common frogs. Um, that will allow us to predict what's going to happen to common frogs in the future in the UK and it's going to allow us to model potential management interventions. If you're concerned about mathematical modelling and you think it sounds terribly, terribly difficult and complicated, uh, you don't need to be too worried. This is going to be more of a coding project than a maths project uh, because of the nature of the model we're going to use. Um, you don't have to be an expert coder. You do have to want to learn to do it. Um, if you are interested and you want to learn, then that will be no problem at all. And you should be able to get on top of this quite easily. And hopefully this will produce some significant and important results, which will have impacts on amphibian conservation in the UK um, and potentially in the rest of Europe, where rhinovirus is also causing problems. Uh, so that's the project. How about the team? Could we have the next slide, please, Amy? So that's me on the left. Obviously, I chose a photo of me doing something cool. Um, most of the time I sit in an office um, and drink tea, but I do occasionally get to do things on rivers in Borneo. Um, I've, you've seen me introduced to someone with expertise in sexual selection and the evolution of aggression. I also work in epidemiology. Um, I've got a background in disease ecology and epidemiological modeling. Uh, Laurie Lawson Handley, who's in the middle, um, she is an expert on eDNA techniques. Um, and then Trent Garner on the right, he's from the Institute of Zoology in London, which is the scientific arm of, uh, of, of London Zoo. 
Um, he is a, a large and friendly Canadian gentleman, and he is probably Britain's main authority on Rana virus in, in the UK amphibian community. Um, so that's a really good supervisory team. Um, I don't know how many PhD su students we've supervised between us, um, but it's probably over 40. We've got lots of experience um, and we're all quite friendly people. Um, so that's that's the project, that's the supervisory team. Um, if anyone's got any questions, ask when there's a slot here or just drop me an email and I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Hello. Um... Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Phil Morris. I'm a uh, postdoc in biomechanics over in natural sciences, Uni of Hull, and I'm going to be one of the supervisors on this project. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, jumping straight in, our project is looking into how the keratinous beaks of birds affect their functional performance. So, bird beaks are a composite structure with a keratinous sheath called the Rampathica uh, overlying a bony core. As you can see in the images on the left of the screen, the Rampathica can be pretty hugely variable in morphology, varying in size, shape, color, and composition. These differences in morphology pose both functional and biomechanical questions, as well as biodiversity questions, as it is the Rampathica that's the one that's coming into direct contact with the bird's environment during feeding, preening, nest building, or any of the other numerous behaviors that are carried out using the beak. Most morphological studies of the beak have been conducted on the bony core rather than the Rampathica, and so, and no studies have been conducted examining the morphological co-variation of both of these structures together. Now, if the shape of the Rampathica perfectly matched with the underlying bone, this wouldn't be much of an issue, but we know that that's not the case. Uh, the Rampathica can extend greatly beyond the tip of the bony core, dramatically altering both the length and the curvature of the beak overall. And you can see that in some of the X-ray images to the bottom left. Moreover, we know that the amount of covariation and shape between these two tissues differs between the bird, different bird families. Uh, and then so excluding these shape variations and focusing just on bone or just keratin may have significant implications for how the functional morphology of the beak has been interpreted. So in this project, we aim to rectify this emission. Uh, we plan to use CT scans to reconstruct uh, the bone and the rampathica of a number of bird beaks. Uh, and from there, we'll use geometric morphometrics, which is a method for the quantification of differences in shape. Um, and we're going to use that to assess how the bony and the correctness beak vary and co-vary with each other in form across a wide range of bird taxa. Um, you can see an example of GMM, and it's used on bird skulls in the past and on the middle of the screen. With the results from our GMM analyses in mind, uh, we're then intending to use those to explore functional consequences of the differences in the shape of the rampathica. Uh, this will be explored using finite element analysis, uh, called FEA, um, which is a method that allows us to virtually expose a structure to different mechanical forces and measure how they respond and resist those forces. And you can see uh, examples of FEA and its usage are on the right of the screen. So using FEA, um, variables such as thickness and the shape of the Rampathica are going to be adjusted and in different areas, and we're going to use that to um, see how that affects uh, mechanical stress and strain patterns throughout the beak and the skull. Uh, the results of this have implications for modeling of all beaked taxa, but will be particularly useful for understanding extinct species, um, perhaps most notably including some types of dinosaur, um, where the precise soft tissue morphology is often poorly known. So this project offers a chance of providing a better understanding of how the hard and soft tissues of the beak evolve together. And from that, we'll be able to use that to gain a greater appreciation of biodiversity as it, uh, of all beaks and all the different taxas in which it's evolved throughout time. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? Uh, so our team is very multidisciplinary uh, and includes the project lead, Dr. Jen Bright, who sends her apologies that she couldn't be able to attend today. Uh, it also includes myself and Dr. Uh, Stefan Lautenschlager, uh, and the three of us are paleobiologists of a sort, all specializing in finite element analysis, comparative anatomy, geometric morphometrics, and biomechanics across a broad range of taxa, um, with Stefan specializing more in different kinds of extinct stuff, and Jen specializing more in birds, uh, with me being more of a feeding biomechanics person. We also have uh, a dedicated engineering expert on the team, uh, which is Dr. Pete Watson, uh, who brings a particular expertise in the engineering aspects of FEA and helps us to ground truth all of our methods. Um, that's about all the time I have, so thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have, or feel free to reach out to Jen at j.bright at hull.ac.uk. Thanks very much.
Well, good evening, everyone. Yeah, my name is Andy Nunn. I'm an ecologist in the School of Natural Sciences at the University of Hull. Um, I mainly work on fish, and that's what this project is about. Um, so we know a lot about the impacts of migration barriers on fish that come in from the sea. For example, we know if salmon come in from the sea and we build a, a dam in their way, it can stop them getting to their spawning grounds. What we know less about is um, the migrations of fish from rivers into the floodplain. So a lot of a lot of fish will spend part of the year in a lowland river, and then at certain times of the year they'll migrate into the floodplain either to reproduce or to feed or to shelter from floods. Um, so in a natural river ecosystem, the floodplains are really important. Unfortunately, in the UK, we've built on most of our floodplains. So we've built houses and <clears throat> fish don't have the access to the floodplains that they used to have. So the aim of this project is to use a combination of um, traditional fish surveys, biotelemetry, so um, tracking fish movements and also biochemical analyses to look at the possibility of using artificial habitats to somehow try and rehabilitate these floodplains. So um, we'll do some traditional fish surveys. We can tag the fish with little microchips like Domino mentioned earlier. We can monitor their movements between the floodplain and rivers, see if there are certain times of year that they're migrating. We can't tag very, very small fish though, such as larval and juvenile fish. And so we're going to need to use a chemical analysis for those. So stable isotope analysis. You can take little samples of um, fin clip or scales or um, muscle tissue, and you can analyze that for chemicals and use that information to assess the migrations of fish between, for example, a floodplain and a river ecosystem. So we can work out the importance of floodplains to larval, juvenile and, and adult fish using this combination of techniques. Um, as you might be aware, the UK and globally is undergoing a bit of a biodiversity crisis at the moment, and fresh waters are particularly badly impacted. So the Environment Agency and the Rivers Trust are doing a lot of work to try and improve the status of our rivers, but it's very time, uh, time consuming, very expensive to build these floodplain habitats. So what we really want to do is generate some proper evidence that these things work. So we're going to be able to assess the contribution of the floodplain, the, um, the uh, these artificial habitats to um, the river and food web. Do fish in the floodplain migrate into the river to feed? Um, do floodplain food resources contribute to the river and food web? These sorts of questions that can then provide evidence to um, the Environment Agency and other river managers to try and improve the states of our rivers. Uh, next slide, please. So the supervisory team is me on the left. That's a recent picture of me from just a few weeks ago. Um, in the middle there, we've got Brian Hayden. Um, he's from the University of New Brunswick. So he's a stable isotope expert. Um, so the, the plan is we collect larval and juvenile fish from the floodplain and the main stem of uh, various rivers. We would analyze the samples for carbon, uh, nitrogen and hydrogen. And from that, we can infer uh, the contribution of floodplain um, energy sources to the river and food web. We can, if you like, back calculate the migrations of fish between different habitats. So that's Brian's expertise. He'll be helping out with that. And then on the right, uh, John Bolland, we've already seen. That's another recent picture. He is a fish telemetry expert. So he basically puts microchips in fish and he can assess their movements and the migrations using um, electronically uh, electronic tags so for example we would catch some fish in the in these rivers and in the floodplains we'll put a little microchip in them and then we can put some monitoring equipment in the connecting channels and we can work out if there are certain times of day or certain times of year that they migrate between different parts of the freshwater ecosystem yep thank you any questions please uh, send me an email and i'm happy to answer them Hello everyone, I'm Martin Taylor. I'm um, from the School of Engineering, uh, specifically Chemical Engineering at the University of Hull. And next slide please, Andy. thank you. So this project is vastly different to the others. 
we're going to look at something that is really starting to plague the world and that is the consumer culture that is um waste uh, electrical um that's just well the waste electronics that have just been dumped at landfill and ever since the big push towards cryptocurrencies and um, farming of that sort of style there's been a massive surge in the amount of waste electronics that have been dumped specifically through processors um power supplies hard drives and so on and so forth and just as the statistics show there that this is actually expected to increase further so at the moment um 61.3 million tons are sent to landfill globally it is anticipated by 2030 that this will jump to 70 million tons um as it's completely unregulated sadly only about 17 percent of all of this waste has been collected is collected treated properly and in fact recycled whereas the rest of the the the, the waste is quite often just lost okay after that is sent to landfill which we see in the image or it's incinerated big problem with this is all the metals that are inside of your electronics will begin to percolate through ground uh through the ground uh because at landfill it's mixed waste we have a stick and basic landfills depending on the age of the landfill the metals will digest travel through the ground and as you can see in the image at the bottom there they will reach uh, groundwater supplies or be visible in surface or present in surface runoff that can lead to soil pollution soil pollution um as well as destroying biodiversity um land and seed there so some of the major metals that you can find in there are your common um, copper for your wiring and such as, but inside hard drives and um, flash memory, there's a lot of lead, nickel, cobalt, um, tantalum, aluminium, and tungsten. In semiconductors, we have the precious metals such as platinum, palladium, gold. All of these metals are awash, okay? So they have different values, um, but more importantly, different effects to the human body and animal bodies, okay? So a lot of them are linked to cancers and definite organ, fa organ failure so therefore we need to come up with a solution that can catch these these metal ions in water supplies before they can be ingested now there are technologies out there available that are used for storing but there's nothing really that advances on from that so um if next slide please Annie. the solution that we're pitching is the use of biorenewable engineered materials that have a um, porous network in them okay so as you see on the right hand side we have a wheat straw and local seaweed waste streams that we have activated generating a uh, porous network with a variety of surface areas pore volumes and pore sizes available to us okay and what we intend to do is if you look at the image in the middle of the screen there we can increase those pores and pore concentration using low energy um engineering we can then functionalize the interior pore network using um, chemical additives known as chelators that can trap selectively uh, metals inside the pore network the overall aim is to modify these materials under batch and continuous flow settings where we can then selectively uptake specific metals and separate them from water supplies taking the really high value metals such as your lithiums your uh, which is vital for the future of um, electric cars your platinum palladium your golds we can release them selectively and capture them for further recycling other metals such as your your, uh, your leads and so on and so forth can also be done the same the overall aim is to run this under um the batch conditions so a static system where we can just mix it in a say a big vat then we will um journey on to continuous flow so we can see how much we can pass through a material as uh, mimicking almost the real world behavior if we're looking at a sewage system there this will all be um encompassed by life cycle analysis and techno-economic assessment where we'll be able to look at the current state-of-the-art technologies and map them towards uh, our proposed materials and how we've managed to develop them especially as we're going to be using biorenewable resources in the form of biochars this is where waste streams are paralyzed are using low carbon thermochemical transformations. Can I have next slide, please, Amy? So you can see there that um, there is a familiarity between myself, Amthal, and Ben. Um, much to what Rick said at the very start there, we like to generate a, a family setting 
And um, so the two projects are going to be carried out in similar sort of space, similar supervisory um, teams. So the it kind of brings home that you aren't alone. Okay, you're going to have people working with you, people that you can um, bounce off, and people that you can um, chat about your work with. So I've got a fair few years of material science um, and use of biorenewable materials, uh, as well as materials characterization. So you will be fully trained in X-ray diffraction, thermographic analysis, um, combustion analysis, infrared spectroscopy, electron microscopies, um, all available at the University of Hull, but also with access to facilities off-site as well. For analysis, you will be looking at um, inductive coupled plasma, and mass spectrometry, and UV vis, um, as we complex the metals from solution. Um, I'm Thales on the team, Ben, um, he's our resident LCAT man, and um, Allah is also joining the, uh, our supervisory team, as he has plenty of experience in material science, specifically polymers, because these biorenewable materials are in fact um, well, biorenewable polymers. Thank you, everyone. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, unfortunately, Jane Bunting uh, can't be with us tonight. Um, however, she has uh, managed to prepare some slides to share with us um, uh, about her project, uh, which I will cover with you um, uh, for you now. Um, she's put together a really fascinating project uh, looking at past changes um, of uh, woodlands uh, and, and their soils. Um, and this is really critical um, uh, due to the uh, diverse and unique habitats uh, they provide uh, in, in the UK. Um, the project itself is going to be looking to developing some really innovative um, methods, um, uh, integrating um, uh, targeted uh, development of, of pollen records um, with paleoclimate uh, modeling uh, um, uh, solutions alongside archaeological data. Um, it's absolutely uh, essential uh, to use all of these techniques together uh, to explore uh, how deforestation um, uh, has occurred and how it's impacted uh, the UK's landscape. Um, and this is really key uh, as it's through understanding uh, the past um, that uh, with Jane's team, um, you'll be able to develop and explore uh, future uh, solutions uh, to better plan uh, for woodlands um, in, into the future. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, Jane is joined by an expert team uh, from the School of Environmental Sciences here at Hull, uh, Katia Matos and, and Graham Ferrier, who bring with them uh, a, a wealth of expertise and experience. Unfortunately, none of them uh, can be here tonight to answer any questions. However, they have asked um, that if anybody does have any questions, if they could reach out to them directly by email, please. Um, okay, we could have the, the next slide. Right, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank all of um, the uh, the panel um, who've been here tonight presenting, a, 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 as you've seen, a, a wide range of very diverse and different um, research projects and a special thanks um, to the two uh, students we had right at the start who gave you a lovely overview of, of what the DTP is. Um, now's the chance uh, for, for you all uh, to um, pose any questions uh, to uh, your potential supervisors uh, in the chat. Um, so if you have any questions you'd like to ask, any uh, any thoughts uh, or queries about the program itself, um, please do ask and we'll uh, tr try to provide as, as good as answers as possible. Right, uh, so first question uh, coming in. Um, so, are there any opportunities to mix with other DTP students at different universities? Um, I think I should go to the students themselves to, to answer that. Rick, please. Hello. Um, yeah, loads of opportunity. So, um, as part of, because you, you'll be a DTP student, you'll, you'll, you'll know the people here at Hull and there's a, there's a, 
there's loads of cohorts, so you'll know the whole people, and then you also get loads of opportunity to attend lots of DTP specific training, which will be given by the DTP. So you'll be able to go to York and, and Leeds, and you'll be able to mix and integrate with um, them during training. And there's also loads of socials happening. There's also a DTP um, rep committee that kind of organizes all sorts of socials, Christmases, bowling, meals. Um, it's sometimes they're hosted here in Hull, sometimes in Leeds, sometimes in York. Um, you can get as integrated as you want with the DTP cluster as a whole, or you can just keep yourself to whole. It's completely up to you. Lydia, do you have anything to add? Yeah, adding on from that, the DTP, because there's only two of us in Hull and there's a big group, they really make a concerted effort to make sure that people from Hull feel involved. For example, your train fares are paid, you know, you can get a breakfast on the way if you're like really early morning. Um, and the socials do facilitate the fact that they appreciate we have to go back so it's very early on like we went bowling and we still managed to get back in time and we had a residential uh, a couple of weeks ago Rick was there and it was a really nice opportunity to like actually sit down and get to know people and the main focus it was not on training it was just on getting to know your co thank you right are there any other questions people just please type them into the chat um, send them through to the organisers and, and we'll get them, we'll be able to read them out uh, and get your supervisor um, to ask them. Darren. Uh, there's a question from Fatima that says, will projects demand any prior knowledge in the subject or related research involvement in a similar discipline? Can a student apply with pure enthusiasm on the subject matter alone, of course, while having a good educational background? Um, I mean, for my part, I think it's probably fair to say that suitable training would be given for anything that we ask we'd, we'd hope for you to do but of course mostly we're expecting people with a broad biological background it's probably fair to say but if anyone else has other thoughts please pitch in um then there's a question from jenny about the application process saying we're encouraged to email the prospective supervisors before submitting an application what do the supervisors look for at this initial stage is this a formal email or more of an informal inquiry? Um, how much information should I include? Again, I think it's probably, I'm just speaking for myself, but I think it's probably across the board that it's just very informal at this stage. You don't have to put anything very formal together. Just please do get in touch. It might be that we then ask for you to send a CV um, or a little bit more about your background just so we can see where you're coming from, but we don't need anything very formal to start with. Um, there's quite a lot coming in now. There's um Darren thank you uh, for that there's one for for Domino uh, that I've got here yeah. um Domino um the student might have missed this but what life stage are the salmon having the trackers attached if you could talk a little bit more about that so they're just at the stage where they become smolt and they go out to sea so um so it's their seaward migration rather than their inward migration which is probably what we're more used to thinking about with salmon kind of like finding their way back to their spawning ground but this is they've they've just get, got to uh, the stage where they're ready to go out and start their their sea uh the sea stage of their life cycle so they're sort of about that big thank you uh, domino uh, so another question here for um, Amantho, um, civil engineer here with expertise in structural engineering, um, uh, aims to use uh, biochar um, in concrete as a replacement to cement and aggregate. Um, is there any chance to do this through your project? Um, hi, Farhan. Um, so I'm actually looking for uh, uh, chemical engineers, uh, chemists uh, mainly, um, um, because the um, project uh, needs some uh, background in um, dealing with um, some chemicals, and, like modifications uh, of the biochar, understanding um, the kinetics of uh, the carbon CO2 uh, absorption on on um, solid material. So um, yeah, we're looking for. Um, uh, chemical engineering, chemistry, and maybe uh, physics. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, 
thanks for that. I should add that if there's specific questions about any of the projects that people want to follow up on from today, um, all of the supervisors' emails address are easy to find on the University of Hull's website. You should be able to take down their name um, from the uh, the slide that you have in front of you now and find them straight away on, on Hull's uh, website. Um, further questions, lots of questions coming in. Um, uh, how can I send in applications? Uh, so, in general, the application process is all handled uh, through the through the University of Leeds, um, through uh, the on the DTP uh, website. So you should be able to put in all of your applications to your PhD um, projects there. Um, Obviously, if you want to informally reach out to um, any of the potential supervisors ahead of time uh, to discuss with them in a bit more detail um, about the research projects to find out um, more information um, uh, uh, or about, find out exactly what they're looking for um, in their project, uh, we strongly encourage you to do so. Um, Mantha, there's a couple more um, here you if you'd like to cover those. Um, do you expect environmental engineers to apply? Um, uh, yeah, I answered yes. Uh, yeah, um, environmental engineer will be fine, yeah, um, that they got the, the necessary background. Okay. Uh, if you have more questions, I, I put my email, um, so you can email me for uh, more information. Thank you. Sure. Um, I should also highlight um, that there is a uh, an FAQs um, uh, page on uh, the the DTP website um, that will help support all of you um, through uh, the application uh, process. Um, Uh, so there's a question here coming in around the the last date to apply, which is the 5th of January. Um, can people contact their supervisors um, uh, beforehand um, or, or not? Um, it, yes, you can contact potential supervisors um, at any time and ask them um, uh, for further information around their projects. And I'm sure they'll be keen uh, to uh, to hear from you. Right, is there? Further? There was a question about uh, one question from Celine says, Are the projects fully funded? Ah, yes, that's a, that's a great question. So, all projects are fully funded for three and a half years, um, with um, additional uh, and a very generous um, support for research costs, uh, field work, training, and conferences. Um, so, thank you, Celine. Right, okay, is there any other questions from anybody? Right, in that case, thank you all very much. It's been really great uh, having everybody dial in uh, today. And thank you again uh, to all our fantastic panel members uh, for giving up their time uh, tonight uh, to tell you all about uh, their, their great uh, research projects and we're really looking forward uh, to you uh, uh, applying.